the EU for Ocean SPAO, which is going to be on plastic pollution and working with ocean technology. So we start today our first webinar and we will continue as uh, my colleague will explain to you in a while for two more Mondays with uh, two uh, set of workshops. And uh, a little bit about of our agenda for today that we can see in our next slide. Can we just, uh, Diego? We are going to have a short introduction about what is SPAO and what Scientix is doing uh, by my colleague Isidora. And then we will continue with an introduction to ocean literacy by our first expert, Francesca Alvisi. And we will continue with a network of EU Blue Schools by Dominika Wojcicek. And of course, as we said, we'll have some time with questions. Uh, Isidora, so what is this spouse? What are these spouse about? Can we have some uh, info? Thank you very much, uh, Irini, for having me here tonight and uh, for uh, this introduction. Before I tell everyone what our spouse and what scientists do regarding to spouse, I first would like you to ask to uh, please sign the signature list uh, because through these emails we need we can prove that you attended the workshop. We can uh, as well send you the certificates and share information about the upcoming sessions with you using the emails you provide in the signature list. So please, if we don't find you in the signature list, we cannot share further information with you. So SPAUs are science project online workshops that are co uh, coordinated by, by Scientix and Scientix is a community for science education in Europe. It's an initiative of European Schoolnet that started as um, um, Horizon 2020 funded uh, project um, in 2020 uh, in 2010 and it became an initiative of European Schoolnet in 2023. Uh, as I said, it is a network of um, all people working in the field of science education, so teachers, researchers, policymakers, and other STEM professionals. And uh, we Scientix aims to promote and support the European wide collaboration among all of these uh, stakeholders and we provide various channels and services to our uh, users uh, and our stakeholders. So in this case, Scientix offers benefits uh, to communities like supporting projects, offering training to educators, as well as visibility and networking opportunities. Um, the thing why do we do this because we know that many publicly funded projects like european for uh, eu for ocean um that aim to improve stem education and to share different information about different burning topics um these projects tend to work isolated and only in, and p information tends to reach only people who are involved in the project so when the project's uh, finished the information gets lost and Scientix is actually trying to solve this problem by ensuring uh, collaboration between the projects um, through these workshops as one of the ways uh, to help disseminate their information, newsletters, digest presentations, and to we, we try to ensure that all the information is still there somewhere which is on the Scientix portal. Uh, Scientix portal has a lot of different information, a lot of different um, resources for both projects and uh, teachers that you can use in your classrooms. Uh, so you can go ahead, to head, a, head to the Scientix portal and check it out. When it comes to the Science Project Online workshops more in detail uh, th these are these are workshops related to specific topics they're in they tend to be very interactive and we aim to share information from the projects and resources developed within different projects that are useful for teachers and useful in classrooms and these sessions uh, these 
events tend to take three weeks with uh, first session like this one today lasting for one hour and two sessions that are for one and a half hours and they are more interactive sessions with specific speakers. Tonight we are going to share with you more in general what is going to happen throughout the workshop itself. Uh, lastly, before I uh, give you back to Irini and to our speakers, I wanted to share the certification uh, procedure with you. So participants of the spouse are eligible for a certificate of participation. However, the, the certificates will be issued only to participants who attend all three sessions, who actively participate in the sessions and who have signed the signature list. So please make sure to sign the signature list uh, before the end of the sessions. You can find it several times in the in the work in the presentation and in the chat box. Uh, thank you very much, Irini. Uh, the, you can go ahead and take over. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Isidora. Just to mention here uh, that in the signature list, uh, participants will be able also to select which slot of workshops they would like to attend for the next two weeks. So we have three slots of workshops, one uh, for early years, primary and secondary. So you can choose according to your interest which uh, workshop you would like to attend the next two Mondays. And uh, now I think that uh, we are here to listen to our experts and I would like to invite first our uh, expert Francesca Alvisi, who is a researcher scientist at National Research Council uh, in the Institute of Marine Sciences. And uh, Francesca, actually, I have to say that I'm not an expert uh, on oceans, but I have seen that uh, your research interests are like vast and you have done many, many things. So uh, she has been working for about 10 years on sedimentology, stratigraphy, geochemistry, palynology of alluvial and lake sedimentary record uh, for paleovaromental and paleoclimatic reconstructions. And she's very interested in the relationship between and land use, uh, geomorphology and landscape evolution with particular attention to the interaction between population, vice resources and migration in historical and current times. And I don't want to say more, as I said, I'm not an expert here, uh, but I'm really, really interested in learning a bit more about uh, plastic pollution and uh, all this information and how we can bring and why we have to bring the sea to the school. I think it's quite important as. So Francesca, the floor is yours and thank you very much for being here with us tonight. I, you just need to unmute your microphone because we cannot <laughs> listen. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much, Irini, and thank you. Uh, thank to the organization for inviting me to to this session and to introduce uh, this session. So my um, expertise is I am a marine geologist. So my expertise is is in part of the ocean science, uh, but I have done different things. So I I hope to be able to, to just to introduce you the ocean literacy that is a kind of um, uh, walk through the ocean science or marine science uh, world. So my introduce introduction will be um, to the to the principles and to the some of the, the main topics that are there. And uh, so uh, can you I just need to manage? take control? Yes, can just I to take manage? control now. Okay. So this is the first slide. Is okay? Yes. So this is the second. It's okay. Great. OK, perfect. So uh, I will uh, I will not focus on plastic at on technology because uh, um, my my role today is to introduce to the general uh, many so to the many concepts and many, many issues and many fields that can be explored by working on ocean literacy. And just briefly starting by the cons from the concept, the ocean literacy is defined and an understanding of the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean. But what does it mean? So this means that uh, an ocean literary, literacy person uh, understand the essential principle and fundamental concepts can communicate about the ocean in a meaningful way. So if you know more, you can understand more and then this talk about these issues in a, in a, 
with a sense, with the main sense, and is able to make informed and responsible decision regarding the ocean and its resources. We hope so. <laughs> what what is what does uh, this uh, let's say this concept come from? Uh, it comes from the U.S. Uh, there was a very huge community of people. Uh, hundreds of scientists and educators, so the mixture between uh, um, expert in, in marine science and in education about ocean or marine issues, they work together to define and to try to find out this um, concept and to describe uh, the effort uh, were mainly uh, um, dedicated to uh, uh, examine that what was done uh, until that time and then to work on the uh, previous uh, material in order to define what is ocean literacy, uh, to assess what the public knows about the ocean and also to try to redress the lack of ocean related content in state and national science education standards, instructional material and assessment. So they understand that these uh, issues were not present and so the, there was a need to, to, to work on it and, and to bring it to the society, to the school, of course, the educational system, but to the society. Um, what, uh, uh, so it's very briefly, of, of course, is a summary. What is, uh, uh, what is, was happening in, in Europe, uh, uh, one of the main, let's say, um, subject of this ocean literacy movement now in, in Europe is MC. It has a long tradition. Uh, this year is a 20 years of ocean literacy involvement. So it's uh, uh, the European Marine Science Educator Association uh, that is an informal non-profit organization which provides a platform for ocean education and promoting ocean literacy within Europe. And Dominica is here representing MC. So maybe she will talk more about, about, about um, MC. And what, which are the goals very, very shortly, the stimulate dialogue between European and international marine educators and scientists. So the same that was done in, in US by uh, uh, the, 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 let's say the similar association that is NMEA, and to provide training and teaching materials to support marine educators and to raise educators awareness on ocean is issues and the need for a sustainable future for coast seas and, and oceans. What is one of the most important event uh, during the year is the, the annual conference of the MC. Uh, and, and since 2012, it, took, uh, it, it was organized in order to discuss and share experience on ocean literacy in, U in Europe and, and beyond. And what is uh, 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 one of the, the, the main issues why uh, it's important to talk to about the ocean science and ocean literacy uh, in in this in this period is more and, and more and more important because we are uh, focusing the society is focusing on on this uh, um, world let's say this environment uh, and uh, and I don't know if you if you know that we are in the UN decade that is dedicated to ocean science for sustainable development. So more and more important to uh, introduce these topics uh, at school and in the educational system because uh, all the society around the world are working on it, on it. So all kind of uh, different sectors. So the scientific one, the educational one, but most of all the economic and and, and with all the, the 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 link to the society and to the environment that you uh, we, you can imagine. So it's it's very important to bring these topics to school. There was there is a very uh, let's say a first one of the first uh, uh, tool that is this book that was published two thousand and and. Um, and uh, 18 by the UNESCO. And there is also the handbook for increasing ocean literacy that is from NMEA, NMEA uh, of the, uh, in the US. But there are a lot of other one, and, and especially there is the handbook of MC, and, but I don't want to <laughs> to steal the time for <laughs> of Dominica about, to talk about that. So just going straight to the to the ocean literacy what is ocean literacy it's 
the, this this huge community build this framework that is I think uh, more and more uh, it's it's important to to discover because it's a kind of a guide no across this world and uh, and uh, a possibility to explore in a in a very short time um, the, the main issues of of marine uh, of marine science and of oceanic no topics. So the framework consists of two consensus documents. One is the essential principle and fundamental concept of ocean science. This is the, the guide and the scope and sequence conceptual flow diagram. This scheme is very important. I try to explain a little how it works. Together, these documents are intended to provide educators with a roadmap to help build coherent and conceptually sound learning experiences for pupils from kindergarten to 12th grade. So across all the school path. The essential principle and fundamental concepts are part of the guide. So you can read it in, very, in a very short time and have a panorama, um, an idea, a landscape you know, or seascape about ocean science. It, it's very interesting and I invite you to do it because it's really a, a nice uh, reading and it's also very helpful to try to focalize a bit uh, what's going on and, and what are the possible links. I will try to summarize all of them in a short time, but uh, try to be to, to explore them with you and try to um, I just say, um, try to uh, put kind of no uh, uh, the interest and and try to raise your interest in in exploring these documents. So the scope and sequence conceptual framework diagrams it's a little bit complex, but it's really easy to understand. I I think this is uh, the, the 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 picture that is available, let's say, and you have the ocean literacy, the seven principle here, and each principle have four levels of complexity uh, and you can scroll it down and to uh, investigate the, the levels according to your uh, to, to your school and to your the age of your pupils. So uh, in each of these little uh, rectangular, you have a scheme like this, and they are more and more complex because the, the the they are structured to have a level of complexity that is increasing from top to bottom. And the title is uh, identify the uh, ocean literacy principle and the learning grade. And then you have the topics, they are colored coded. So you have in vertical, these are the, the you, you see there are the four colors in this, for example, in this principle, and they are all developed from from top to bottom by uh, increasing the complexity and then the concepts are organized along horizontal lines so these are the concepts and they are more and more complex and so you can go you can go down and discover the the complexity of, of each of them so let's start with the first principle the first principle is a, a very simple one but is a very revolutionary one because the, it says that the Earth has one big ocean with many features. So the idea is that the oceans are not many, the seven oceans or the seven seas, but just one. And it has, uh, it, 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 it has to do this principle. It has to do with some of the concepts are a link of, of some topics that are very important. So, so the first uh, part, and not because I am a marine geologist, but because the the, the seafloor, how it is made, is important to understand how it works, what is going on inside the ocean. So it has to do with geological features and particularly about plate tectonics and ocean floor. So how the 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 crust of the Earth is made, how it is moving, and how this movement and these shapes are, um, let's say, determining the feature of the ocean. So the shape or uh, morphology of the ocean is of the ocean floor is very irregular. Is like the, the 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 continental surface, the sea surface, the sea floor surface is very complex. The slopes are gentler than on land-based mountain ranges because they are in water, not in the air, and the distribution of sea depth is indicated on bathymetric maps where isobaths are plotted. So 
I just want to summarize some point and some ideas on what is going, what is inside this principle. Of course, I have not enough time to go in details in each of them. And uh, as as uh, as I said, uh, the ocean floor is just this is a, a section. This is a kind of ideal section. Uh, it's not a flat pan, but it just is is uh, it has a, a a landscape. In this case, we say the seascape, and so it has a lot of uh, uh, features that are very interesting, and they derives from the the history of the of the of the seafloor. So how can I? Ah, OK, this here. OK, so another point uh, uh, in the first principle is it has to do with the ocean water properties uh, because uh, ocean water properties are are peculiar and it has to do. They have to do with salinity, temperature, pH, so acidity or basic you know, say alkalinity. And uh, so the seawater have particular characteristics and the sea salt have particular characteristics because there is not only the, the, the salt that we use in the kitchen for cooking, but there are different salts. And these salts make uh, have different characteristics and they can be also, uh, they also determine the uh, behavior of the, of the seawater. And here you can find a kind of this distinctions about uh, different kind of water according to their salinity. So between fresh water, brackish water, saline water, and briny, briny water. So as I as I said, the, the the characteristic of the water, of the ocean water, and the characteristics of the flow determines the circulation of the water inside this all this big ocean. And so the big ocean as as uh, uh, one main let's say. Uh, way of transport that is determined by salinity and temperature. So we call it thermohaline circulation. And these pictures will just uh, summarize this main, uh, the main currents across all the oceans, and they are called conveyor belt. And even even here, since the circulation of the ocean has to do with a, with a, with a, this pan, let's say, with a, this uh, bowl of water, it has to do with uh, uh, salt and and temperature. It also it, it is uh, determined by currents, uh, waves, and tides. But another important issue within this principle is to talk about the water cycle because the ocean is is a most is a main part of the water cycle and uh, uh, and everything is starting from the ocean and come back to the ocean so i i uh, i think that the studying by studying the water cycle you can have the first you know a first meeting with the ocean but it's important to learn that we have a cycle that is going up from the ocean in the atmosphere down to the land and back to the ocean. So the and the third part of the the first principle is uh, about sea level. So the the ocean is not stable. The sea level has changed during the, the the centuries, but during the geological time. And so what is very important is that we understand what is the sea level, the, the, why it's important to know the sea level, because it's a reference level, and uh, what are the oscillation of the sea level, because of uh, we can have impact on the cost, for example, but we can also need the, this uh, sea level measurement in order to fix a point of reference for our measurement, for example, altitudes you know, of our mountains. So the average height of the ocean relative to the Earth, uh, so the sea level, sorry, is the average height of the ocean relative to the Earth, taking into account differences caused by tides. And the sea level changes, uh, we have sea level changes when? When we have plate tectonic that causes the volume of ocean basins to change and the height of the land. The polar ice caps can melt or grow, so the, the level can go up or down. And we also have seawater expansion and contraction when it warms or cools. So the levels of seawater is another interesting topic. It is not very well known, but is very important for many uh, of, of our, let's say, daily life things. No? <laughs> and so I, I invite you to, to explore it. 
And this is just an image about the trend in absolute sea level across Europe based on satellite measurements. And this has to do with the, what we are calling saying ocean, war, ocean uh, sorry, climate warming. And so the increase of sea level, the melting of a glacier. So the very, very important, um, how do you say, um, uh, impact on our daily life. So the second principle has to do, uh, the, the title is oh, the ocean and life in the ocean shape the features of the, art, of the earth. So here we have again to do with the plate tectonics, but also with the rock cycles. This is one of the many cycles we, were, we will talk about. One is the water cycle, then the, the, the most important is also the rock cycle. Uh, and uh, uh, we will see all other kind of cycles. So all rocks end up in the sea, but they are also born in the sea. Most of our continents are made of oceanic rocks or rocks that are uh, originated in the ocean. So they are sedimentary rocks originated in the ocean and now they are part of the continents. We have erosion and recycling, new formation and so on. So the Earth li li lithosphere is the rigid outer shell of the planet, including the crust and the upper mantle. Uh, it is fractured into seven or eight major plates and many minor plates. And here you have an image about the main plates of our, of our planet. And where the plates meet, their relative motion determines the type of plate boundary. So they can be convergent plates, divergent plates or transport plates. So this also determines the shapes of our ocean floor and of course of the continent. And what about the rock cycle? The rock cycle is the model that represents the genetic relationship of rocks to each other. So how, what, is, what are the relationship between the rocks or among the rocks and uh, uh, to the magma? So to what is the, the, the mountain? So the, the let's say, the fluid part of our planet, uh, that is uh, in, 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 the, in the upper, so in the superficial, uh, let's say, layer of our planet. Rocks are constantly being formed, transformed and recycled through, through physical, chemical and biological processes. Francesca, so, I just want to remind you about the time that uh, yes. you don't have so much time yet left, like five, six minutes. Ah, Oli! Oh, wow! <laughs> time, <laughs> time flies. Yes. So to introduce all the all the ocean literacy principle is not a lot of time. I know, I know. So I I, I try to be very short, but uh, so that the presentation is there. So we have uh, in the second we have also other cycles that are the biochemical cycles, so water cycle, nutrient cycle, but also salt cycle. And, and then we have all the cycles about the nutrients. So carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycles, all these cycles are very important because it's they are, um, are dealing with the passage between the matter between organic and inorganic systems. So these are very important part of our functioning, of the function of our planet. So they are most important to, to be understand. So there are phosphorus, there are a lot of other cycles that bring across the, 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 um, the matter. So the third pr principle has to do with um, uh, weather and climate. The difference between weather and climate are very important. I have not time enough to go into the data details, but weather and climate has to do with ocean, with um, Earth's uh, heat budget. But also it has to do with the topography, altitude, latitude, rotation. So the climate are defined for the continents. So they are dealing with how the continents are made and what is the relationship between the continents and the ocean. So the, there is also a, a issue in, an issue about the global climate change, of course. So what, what is the interaction between the ocean and atmosphere and how this interaction is changing now because of our uh, impact on the atmospheric CO2, for example. So there are a lot of interaction between ocean and atmosphere. And this is these are very important for the for the uh, moderate. Um, to moderate or for the moderation of weather and climates. And there are also uh, other uh, influences that are on, on the currents, for example, on, on the living organism and, and so many, many other influence. So 
what are the consequences of the global uh, climate change? This has to do with us, but not, not only with all the organisms. So it's important to know how they interact and how they can change the system, both the atmosphere and, and the ocean. And this is an, uh, a very interesting images of, of the European Environmental Agency about the climate change impacts on Europe. So you can explore it. So the fourth principle is about the ocean that makes Earth habitable. And this has to do with ocean, ocean um, sorry, with oxygen production and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the cycles of uh, the cycle of oxygen. So oxygen is another important fundamental element and it comes from the ocean, especially at the beginning, but still now it's important. And uh, there is a history about this uh, uh, oxygen uh, origin and I invite you to explore it. It's really very interesting and uh, we skip it because the time is short. And there are also another point very interesting that is about this the study of the rocks and especially sedimentary rocks allowed us to understand or to reconstruct the history of our planet and also the um, most of the rocks that are outcropping on the continents are of uh, marine origin for that reason ocean makes earth habitable not only because of it, of oxygen but also because of the roots of the continents of our structures the rocks of the continents and many uh, and the history of life on earth has been reconstructed on uh, um, through the sedimentary rocks and and many animals and many uh, organisms are orig have originated in the ocean they are still in the ocean some of them some not these are some examples these are some fossils and some uh, actual or present animals that have uh, can testify the link between the 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 the, the um, origin of life in the ocean and our uh, present life the fifth principle have to do with the uh, uh, habitat and ecosystems and life so the ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems and again you can see uh, many sketches many schemes that are summarizing this link between all these systems and the, what is interesting is that the ocean is a 3D, three-dimensional environment. So there are many more habitats and, and, and niche than in, on land. And this is as also to do with the with the um, um, with the features of the animals of the of the organisms that has developed to be able to cope with this environment that is particular. And the limiting factors, uh, for example, for photosynthesis is temperature and light. So what is the vegetation, let's say, ve ve <laughs> plant, uh, even if algae is not plant, but anything, uh, anyway, the, the vegetation part uh, 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 of the, the, the primary production is, is um, linked and is uh, um, determined by by the presence of temperature and light this is an image of chlorophyll how it is distributed across the the, the globe and it has to do with ecosystem diversity and i as i told you there is a vertical donation and a horizontal donation since it, it's a 3d model is uh, sorry it is a 3d environment this this is a very important feature and we maybe we don't think about it enough. So these are some of the sketches you can find about the zonation of marine life. And it has also to, to, to do with the diversity of life. So adaptation, nutritional behavior, life cycles, reproductive strategies, and so on. So you can find in thousands of pictures. So the, the six principles has to do with our interaction with this system. What is our interaction? We are inextricably interconnected and uh, because of re renewable and non-renewable resources, but also because we are linked to the ocean because our history is linked to the ocean. Our exploration is linked to the ocean, but our economy. So we have energy resources from the sea. There are renewable and non-renewable. There are marine fisheries, renewable and non-renewable, let's say so. Uh, raw materials, salt, uh, sand. But we have also pharmaceuticals. So more and more 
molecules are discovered in the sea that are useful for um, producing uh, products for us, for medicines and so on. We have food products that are very obvious, like maybe fish or, or, or shrimps, and uh, maybe less obvious like algae that are present in many products, but there are also a lot of chemicals linked to the salt or different salts that we have in the ocean. We have also cultural heritage or beautiful landscape. We have recreational areas and we have also this main transport route as, as the ocean is the main transport route on the earth. And uh, But we have also a big impact, a huge impact on, on ocean atmosphere. So you can, you can discover and you can go through the impacts and try to understand how we how can uh, behave in, in a more sustainable way in order to decrease this impact. And what are the main impacts uh, at the moment on the ocean? But maybe some of them, they are not so obvious. And uh, uh, there is also the opposite. So there is the impact of ocean on us and through the climate or directly through the ocean, so through the waters or through the what we what we eat or what we use from the ocean. Uh, we have uh, a very already a, a, a rather long history about rela relationship with the ocean, but in the last 20 years, this relationship has changed. And so we are um, aware, more aware about the, the, the sustainability issues that we need to manage the, the ocean in a more sustainable way. Otherwise, this system is will, will collapse. And if this system will collapse, we will probably collapse with it. And uh, so this is uh, another point that is important is what is our responsibility uh, for about or for or <laughs> uh, uh, for the ocean? And so the ocean decades, as I told you, have a lot of endorsements and a lot of activities, a lot of actions that are in in progress and more and more are are are, um, uh, are coming because the society is is bringing these topics to the uh, all these topics to the to the attention of the of our society of our citizens and so the last principle is about the unexplored so what we don't know about the ocean so if if we think that we always and we we uh, explore the ocean because it's a way of transport because the life was along by the sea by the coast and but still now we we know only 6% of of the ocean maybe more some of the exploration are not very well known because are, they are made by private companies. So we don't know exactly what the private company knows about the ocean. We know that for the from the scientific point of view, we know less than 10 percent of the of the ocean, even if we know general things about the ocean. But specifically, we were not able to investigate, particularly the deep ocean that is now the new frontier no so uh, so but our history of exploration is is a long history we have a lot of uh, um, proof of that uh, but over the last 50 years the use of marine resources has increasingly increased significantly and for for that reason we have to be aware on how we use it but also the technological development, uh, since this pause, uh, SPAW, has to do with technological um, activity or the, uh, development, there, is, uh, uh, there are many, many, many new technologies every day coming uh, ahead that allows us to explore the ocean. But this means also a lot of responsibility on how we explore it, how we impact on it, how we use what we found on uh, in the ocean. So exploration allows a better understanding of the ocean system and it needs a lot of collaboration. So different, um, um, how do you say, different uh, professionals. So there are a lot of possibility also for young people to explore this huge world of blue careers that are more or less obvious. 
And close collaboration, uh, this means also a lot of new ideas, a lot of perspective for investigation, but a lot of connections also with policy makers and decision makers with economy, and so with to build bridges across the world. And uh, um, the ocean, since it is la largely unexplored, uh, we need more and more, as I told you, uh, a lot of new uh, technologies. And so this is something that it has a very huge uh, field of investigation of technological development of research transfer to the economical sector. And there are a lot of possibility of development also for new career, blue career, blue uh, economy issues and also blue uh, new blue enterprises. So uh, I, I, there is a, what is can I can I leave you is this creating the ocean Internet of Things that is something that has to do with the Internet of Things that we are doing on land. Uh, so this also a parallel that is possible to do with the with the pupils uh, in in the classroom. But I would like to leave you with this last picture that is. For me, it's, it's fantastic. It's a model. It's it's a kind of not real picture, but it's something that uh, is an ocean simulation made by the NOAA that maybe can summarize what are our level of knowledge of our level of possibility to to talk about the ocean. So I think that this is one of the maybe the best way to say thank you. And uh, hello, uh, sorry, <laughs> and uh, I hope you will be able to understand something because the time is really too short to, to talk of all these wonderful issues. Thank you very much, Francesca. Yes, I agree that the time is not a lot. And I mean, there are so many principles and I think I already have some questions for you in a while. Uh, but I would like uh, to go on now with our second uh, speaker. So we have with us Dominika Wojcicek, who is an oceanographer and a graduate of Gansk University and San Francisco State University, specializing in marine geology and paleoclimatology. And her research has centered on reconstructing past climate changes through an analysis of microfossils to determine sea surface temperature. And now, uh, since uh, April 2023, she is managing the EU Blue Schools uh, uh, network uh, on behalf of MSEA, holding certification, communication. So, uh, before passing the floor to Dominica, really, if you are doing things related to blue education, I think it's a great opportunity to apply to become a Blue School. Dominica, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. I will just see if the slides are changing correctly. Did it change? You could took control. I did take now, control. Yeah, and I now could, it's working, okay. yes. Uh, okay, so thank you for this introduction. Yes, I am in fact working for MC and I am managing uh, the Secretariat of the Network of European Blue Schools. Uh, which means I keep in touch with teachers, evaluate presentations and everything. Um, I will try to speak really fast so we don't, so we still have some time for, for questions. Uh, uh, first, I would like to give you a little bit of background on the EU for Ocean Coalition uh, because the EU for Ocean name is being thrown here and there and, and people sometimes get confused. So the EU for Ocean Coalition is an initiative of the European Commission um, because the European Commission sees that need to advance and enhance ocean literacy among European citizens. If you remember from Francesca's presentation, uh, ocean literacy in the simplest terms is the understanding of our influence on the ocean and ocean's influence on us. So without that knowledge, without that understanding, we are not, as a society, we are not able to manage our ocean resources in a sustainable manner. So that's why European Commission invests time and money into creating this more ocean literate society. And this is mostly done through bottom up approach. So through engagement, direct engagement with various stakeholders across European Union. And in order to do that, the EU for Ocean uh, coalition was formed with three major pillars that 
tend to um, engage with different types of stakeholders. The, one of them is the EU for Ocean platform that brings together institutions, organizations, businesses, uh, research uh, institutions, um, blue economy industry, civil society, education, for them to be able to collaborate, to find partners, to share new ideas, uh, to um, develop the ocean literacy in their own in, uh, institutions. The second um, pillar of the EU for Ocean Coalition is Youth for Ocean Forum, uh, which is a platform for collaboration for young uh, professionals, people ages uh, 16 to 30, and that also is a platform for them to collaborate, to share ideas, to connect with like-minded people, uh, to find maybe career and development opportunities. And the third pillar is the network of European Blue Schools, and that is the way to engage with teachers, with students, with schools, and introduce um, blue education and ocean literacy into schools. So we are just one part of the EU for Ocean um, Coalition. So what is a blue school? Um, a European blue school is, in the simplest terms, a school that brings the ocean into the classroom. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a, a grassroots or a bottom-up initiative. So we engage directly with the stakeholders. Unlike a top initiative where, you know, a, maybe a ministry of education in your respective countries would uh, force the schools to uh, accept new blue curriculum. That is not what we do. We work with teachers, we work with students in schools in order to bring the ocean into the classroom through them rather than, rather than from the top. Um, this is mostly done through projects, through project-based learning. Uh, so sort of developing additional activities that connect with the curriculum, but allow to bring in new knowledge. And we call it Find the Blue. Uh, we used to have a Find the Blue challenge. So finding your own connection to the ocean. Again, ocean literacy is understanding our influence on the ocean and ocean uh, ocean's influence on us. So finding the blue is understanding that influence or a part of it, a little um, a little part of it that is directly connected to us and through finding the blue and developing a project around it, uh, teachers and students uh, learn something new, change their school, change their environment, and hopefully have positive um, impact on the environment. Why do we need um, blue schools? This is one of my favorite slides. I have been using it for uh, a while now, it is at least my third presentation with it, uh, because it really shows the disconnect between us and the ocean or water um, that we have in this world. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a salmon as it is when it's alive as a fish, and not many people can recognize it. Most of us don't know how the salmon looks like. What we connect with the salmon is what we can see on the right-hand side. Well, maybe not fillets, um, you know, floating in the water. But this is an image that was very popular online about a year and a half ago when someone prompted artificial intelligence to create an image of salmon in the river. And it is funny, but it is also tragic because artificial intelligence is, learns, I mean, we teach us, people who create artificial intelligence, we feed it information uh, or it gathers information online and that's how it learns how the world looks like and then can output information. Well, in this case, we can clearly see that us as a society, we perceive salmon not as a living fish, but as food. And you can test it for yourself. If you Google salmon and click on images, it will mostly show you food, not actual fish. Um, and that is a disconnect because it is okay to eat salmon and there's nothing wrong with it. It's very nutritious, it's very healthy, but I mentioned to you that European Commission recognizes the need for ocean literate society in order to sustainably manage our resources. And that's where exactly where ocean literacy comes in because if we don't remember that salmon is also a fish that needs to grow for a certain time, needs certain conditions to grow, needs food, needs time and space, uh, very specific places to spawn, lay eggs um, and you know procreate, reproduce, then we will not be able to eat the salmon. And the thing about salmon is that 
Um, it is a fish that is very important to our culture and to our economy. It is the, um, the top aquacultured or farmed fish in Europe and in the world. And as such, it is also a top fish that we eat. It's usually tuna and salmon. So it is very important to us. It is also an anadromous fish, which means that it lives in the sea, but it migrates upstream, up rivers for spawning, so for laying eggs. And so there is no excuse if you don't live on the coast. You cannot say, oh, I don't know salmon because I don't live cl close to the sea. This fish is present across the continent in fresh waters, and it is um, one of the top freshwater catches in Europe. So it really is present in our waters, but still the majority of us cannot uh, recognize this fish when it's alive, only when it's food. And it was also very much for centuries, um, very much connected. Uh, as Francesca said in the sixth principle, we are with the ocean, we are inextricably, inextricably interconnected. And so we are with the salmon uh, because it was always present in our culture and it provided nutritious food that was very important. And Vikings or um, uh, people from Wales and Scotland, you know, many centuries ago, already knew how important that fish is and praised it almost like a saint or a god. And in the 21st century, we have a disconnect and we don't understand how the, or we forgot how the ocean works and how we depend on it. And the idea behind Blue Schools is not, of course, for every student that graduates a school in Europe to know how a salmon looks like. I assume that that will never happen. But this is, again, to restore this connection with the ocean and understand how we work with the ocean, um, how we influence the ocean, and how the ocean influences us. Uh, we don't have much time. Uh, I have two more slides left, but I also, for the preparatory materials, I asked the participants to read about the principles behind the EU Blue Schools, um, the ones like project-based learning, open schooling, and being an agent of change. So I think I can skip this slide and save some time for some time for question questions and answers. We can discuss the principles and the foundations um, in that part of the presentation. Uh, we have ten criteria to become a blue school. I would not also focus on that right now to save some time. Uh, you can find it in the handbook. You can find it on our website. You can use the QR code on the screen to get to our website. You can also always email me at um, info at blueschools.eu. If you have any questions about the criteria, how to become a blue school, where and how to submit your application, you are always welcome to do so. And I will answer all of your questions. Thank you very much, Dominica, and thank you that you managed to wrap up everything in <laughs> such a short time. But as you said, like there is the material there that uh, we shared with the participants, so I think they can have quite a lot of information there useful for their work. Uh, I would like before we proceed to uh, the questions, just uh, to let you know that uh, maybe you know that the EU for Oceans is uh, one of the project partners of uh, the Science Discovery Campaign 2024. So this year, the the Scientific STEM Discovery Campaign is a joint international initiative co-organized with the Life Terra project. And the initiative invites EU educators, projects, organizations, libraries, schools, universities, uh, youth clubs, and all interested stakeholders across Europe and beyond to celebrate careers and studies in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the campaign invites participants to share any STEM related activity or action that you have organized um, then contributed and you did until May 2023. And these activities can take many forms by organizing or attending an event, implementing a learning scenario, attending, organizing a workshop, a project like activity, festival, a webinar, inviting experts in your class. So if you had done things like that related to ocean literacy, you can participate and par submit your activity until the 30th of April 2024. 
Uh, I would like to thank both uh, our uh, experts for their contribution today, which I think it was really, really interesting and useful. And I will see in the next uh, two workshops, two sessions of SPOUSE, what we are going to do. So thank you all very much. And it was just the official closing that we can close the recording. And now we can proceed and see if you as participants have some questions that uh, you can share. And I see that already